So today, uh, we are discussing Lenin and Trotsky, what they really stood for. A uh, hundred years after the death of Lenin, uh, there's been few figures in history as, as slandered and misrepresented as Lenin. Although if there is one figure who's been equally slandered, uh, Trotsky certainly would uh, fit that bill. And the, uh, the, the death of Lenin uh, 100 years ago was uh, this, uh, the, the, the starting point for uh, a campaign of slander that began with uh, Stalin and the, and the Troika in the Soviet Union uh, against Trotskyism, as they invented. trying to divide these uh, great revolutionary figures who in life were, were identified. The Bolshevik party was known as the party of Lenin and Trotsky. I won't steal any more from uh, our speaker, who today is uh, Jack Halinsky Fitzpatrick. Jack is uh, a member of the International Executive Committee of the, uh, the Revolutionary Communist International, which has been founded this week. He will speak for about an hour and a half, including translation, and then we'll have time for questions and contributions, and we'll have a good discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jack. Thank you. So in 1902, Leon Trotsky had escaped exile in Russia. He travelled across Europe, and he finally arrived in London extremely early in the morning. But he was so excited, so he couldn't help. He just started hammering on, uh, on Lenin's door. He burst in, and he found this great revolutionary leader in bed. But they proceeded to have a long political discussion about the situation in Russia. Now, as Ben said, these two uh, figures, Lenin and Trotsky, are presented as uh, fierce enemies. But really, the disagreements that they did have were disagreements of genuine revolutionaries. And at every major turning point, really, they found themselves on the same revolutionary line. And I think this discussion is an important one to have because there is a new generation of people considering themselves communists who will be coming across these debates. So we need to have answers in order to win them over to genuine communism. On top of this, whilst these, some of these debates obviously happened uh, a long time ago, if we learn the method that these revolutionaries used when approaching these questions, that will help us to uh, work out the answers to future questions. Now, the first major conflict between these two great revolutionaries happened at the Second Congress of their party in 1903. Everything seemed to be proceeding more or less fine until right towards the end of the Congress, there was a clash between Lenin and uh, another member of the party, Martov. This was a clash over uh, who could basically be a member of this party. Lenin said that in order to be a member of this party, you had to personally participate in one of the party organizations. Martov, though, opposed this. He said that uh, anyone could be a member, they just need to cooperate with the party. This seems uh, you know, very technical, a small uh, thing. But this uh, division between these two revolutionaries has been used to support one of these myths about Lenin where apparently Lenin wanted a small, uh, elitist organization of intellectuals, whereas Martov wanted a broad and democratic organization. Now, obviously, this is not true at all. What Lenin understood was that when you were starting out building a political party, you need to build on firm foundations. So the same Lenin who fought for strict membership criteria at this time fought for uh, broad membership criteria later in 1912. This was when the party was becoming a mass party, and he said that anyone who considered themselves a Bolshevik was entitled to become a member. So what we can understand, really, is that different tactics need to be applied depending on what stage of development you're at at building the revolutionary organization. At root, this dispute that was taking place really reflected the fact that the organization was making a transition at this time. It was going from the stage where uh, everyone knew everyone. It was a small group of basically friends. And every organization goes through a stage like this, but there tends to, the things kind of happen where political uh, 
questions tend to get trumped by uh, personal considerations. So Lenin realized that it was time, really, to professionalize the organization. And as part of this, he wanted to reduce the editorial board to three comrades, and they were the comrades, really, who were doing the work. Now, Trotsky opposed this, uh, this proposal from Lenin. Uh, two of those people who were proposed to be removed from the editorial board, Zasulich and Axelrod, Trotsky had actually lived with for some years. He held them in very high esteem. They had huge authority in the movement. And so for Trotsky, he basically saw this. He thought, well, this is an unjustified, unprovoked attack from Lenin. What, what's going on? He's attacking some leaders of the party. Now, this conflict, really, it started this uh, famous split between what became the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. And with Trotsky so uh, kind of shocked and angered at the way Lenin, or the way he saw Lenin had behaved, after this uh, split, for, for a period, he ended up on the side of the Mensheviks. <coughs> and it's this fact that uh, often is used for one of the myths that Stalinists sometimes say about uh, Trotsky, that he was a Menshevik, full stop. But Trotsky had huge disagreements with the Mensheviks. He spent the whole time whilst he was a member arguing with them constantly and left within a year. And from then on, he stood independently from the two uh, factions. He basically had disagreements with both of them. But he had a certain conception of how to form a revolutionary party, which was different from, Trump, uh, from Lenin, in that he basically believed that it would be revolutionary events themselves would push the best of the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks together. He didn't understand, actually, at this time, that the building of a revolutionary organization isn't an automatic process. Actually, it was only Lenin, really, who understood that you need uh, an open battle of ideas to form a politically homogenous organization that's trained before the events happen. And really, it was this understanding of Lenin that allowed the Bolsheviks to come to power eventually. But this had never been done before. It's never been done since. And so can we really blame Leon Trotsky, who's 23 at the time, for not exactly seeing this? Now, in the period leading up to 1917, Russia was an economically backward nation. The peasantry made up 80% of the population, and the working class made up only 10%. You did have large-scale industry, but this was really a product of the export of capital from the main imperialist powers into Russia. And this is a demonstration of the law of combined and uneven development. Economically backward countries can catch up with the more advanced ones, but they will do so in a distorted and uneven manner. And so that meant that in Russia, what you had was you had the most modern factories in the world combined in the same country with uh, you know, elements of feudalism. The native Russian bourgeoisie was very weak and reliant on foreign imperialism. And whilst the working class was small, it was actually, relatively speaking, much stronger than the native Russian bourgeoisie. And so you imagine that filled the Russian bourgeoisie with fear. It meant that they were unable to play the same revolutionary role that uh, their class brothers in England and France in the past played. Now, at this time, all of the tendencies in Russia, the Mensheviks, Bolsheviks, and Trotsky, they all thought uh, the perspective was for a bourgeois democratic revolution. This would be something that did things like uh, abolishing the feudal relations in the land and ensuring political democracy in a bourgeois sense. But the Mensheviks said, OK, look, this is a bourgeois revolution, therefore it must be led by the bourgeoisie, essentially. The workers would have to restrict their demands to just supporting the bourgeoisie in order to bring about a revolution that would kind of clear the decks for the development of capitalism. That would allow the economy to grow, it would also allow the working class to grow, and then sometime in the distant future you would be able to have a socialist revolution. Now, Lenin and the Bolsheviks disagreed with this. They said, look, the bourgeoisie can never lead a revolution because they are tied to the land and they are tied to foreign imperialism. Instead, the class that was the most revolutionary class is the working class. But the trouble is, it's very small. And so the working class, they said, would uh, need an ally, and it could find that ally in the peasantry. <laughs> 
So these two classes would unite, they would overthrow the Tsar, and they would establish what Lenin called the uh, re revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry. It's a bit of a mouthful. Now, after having achieved this revolution, Lenin said that in order to avoid alienating the peasantry, the working class would have to be held back uh, from you know, making socialist demands. But this revolution could act as a spark to spark revolutions in the more advanced West, where you could have socialist revolutions, according to Lenin. And he said that once these were successful, that would then enable a further revolution in Russia. It would uh, allow the Western workers to show the Russian workers the way, he said. Now, Trotsky agreed with Lenin that the bourgeoisie in Russia was unable to lead uh, a revolution. He also said that the peasantry was unable to lead a revolution. If comrades think, you know, what is a peasant? You can have very rich peasants, you can have very poor peasants. And also, what is the nature of life of a peasant? Well, you work on your own separate plot of land, which is totally re separate from all of the other plots of land. <coughs> And so Trotsky was arguing that this makes independent and unified action of this class impossible. It needs to be led by one of the other great classes, the workers or the capitalists. So Trotsky argued that the working class would lead the bourgeois democratic revolution. But he said, look, imagine the working class have achieved this great revolution. They've overthrown the Tsar. Why on earth would they just stop at bourgeois democratic demands? They would push on to social demands. Trotsky also said that you would need to consider the behaviour of the bourgeoisie in this atmosphere. If we demand today to have the eight-hour day, I think even Joe Biden might agree with us. Maybe. But in, in, in abstract, this demand is a demand that's uh, possible under capitalism. But in a revolution where the working class have taken power, uh, Trotsky argued that the bourgeoisie would act in a totally different way. The bourgeoisie would basically fear you know, that uh, appetite grows with eating. And if they won one demand, the workers would demand more. And so they would oppose these demands with things like lockouts. <laughs> And then what do you do? If, if you're a government that's based on the working class in this situation, well, you could capitulate into those demands and give up power. Or you could, purely in order to defend these minimum demands, go beyond them and start nationalizing these industries. Now, Trotsky understood that the working class was small in Russia. But he said it would be possible for the workers to lead the peasants behind them if they included things like land reform in their program. He understood also that socialism in Russia at that time, an economically backward country, was impossible. But a revolution in Russia could spark revolutions internationally. And that could mean that workers' states in the more developed West could be used to strengthen this regime in Russia and you know, allow the completion of the transition to socialism. So that's why for Trotsky, the bourgeois democratic revolution was intertwined with the socialist revolution, which was then intertwined with the international revolution. And that's really what he meant by the theory of the permanent revolution. Now, Trotsky, as I said, had disagreements with both the Mensheviks and the Bolshevik theories of revolution. He argued that the Menshevik theory was reactionary because in order to avoid putting off the bourgeoisie, they would have to hold back the workers. But he also argued that the Bolshevik theory was reactionary, because if you remember, they said that after the revolution, the working class would need to be held back. And so he said that this uh, reactionary nature of the theory would only be revealed after the revolution. And I think he was proven correct on that, which I'll come to. The problem really, I think, was that uh, Lenin's position was a little bit vague. He wasn't clear about what class would be dominant in his kind of conception. But this wasn't a mistake. This vagueness was intentional. He was leaving up to events to fill in the gaps. And there's a very good reason for this. In 1905, Leon Trotsky was the head of the Petrograd Soviets, and that allowed him to observe firsthand how all of the classes would behave in a revolution. Lenin was abroad, playing no direct role in the revolution, and so didn't feel as confident to be so categorical. 
Now, there are two main attacks by the Stalinists on the theory of the permanent revolution. The first of them is they claim that Trotsky said, well, uh, revolutions need to happen everywhere at exactly the same time, otherwise it's completely impossible. <laughs> and so, if you're a, a worker in Italy, you might think, oh, we better not need to go to revolution because we can't be sure that the workers of Germany will, at the exact same time, uh, join us. Now, this is obviously ridiculous. I mean, Trotsky led the Russian Revolution, which I'll come to. But what Tr Trotsky really theorized was that a revolution can start in one country, but it's the uh, transition to socialism which can't be completed unless that revolution spreads. But in any case, if you claim that Trotsky is defeatist, well, you also have to say that Lenin was defeatist. After all, in Lenin's conception at this time, he said that even the bourgeois democratic revolution could not survive unless it spread to the West. Now, the other criticism that is often used is that Trotsky just completely forgot about the peasantry. And that would have led to uh, terrible defeats, right, because of how big the peasantry were as a class. So thankfully, Trotsky didn't lead the Russian revolution. But all Trotsky said was that the peasantry can't act as an independent force. He explicitly said that if it is led by the working class, it has immense revolutionary potential. Okay. Now, Trotsky has a wonderful uh, definition of a revolution, which is the entry of the masses onto the stage of history. But let's think about this. Well, what does that mean? It means that in normal times, the mass of the working class aren't on the stage of history. They don't really pay attention to politics or anything like this. Obviously, it's not because they're stupid or anything like that. One, they don't necessarily have the time to read Capital after coming back from a long shift. But also, they, they wouldn't really necessarily have the inclination in normal times. I mean, why pay attention to politics? Nothing ever changes. But a revolution is when this turns into its opposite and the masses do enter onto the stage of history. But obviously, they do this then without a knowledge of the history of the class struggle, the defeats and the victories. That is, as an aside, where the role of a political party comes in. It's not to start a revolution. Revolutions will happen whether we're here or not. But a revolutionary party that has roots in the masses, has steeled in these past lessons of victories and defeats, it can then use these lessons to guide the movement to victory. Now, in February 1917, you had a revolution. And so you have the masses entering the stage of history. And they didn't have the experience to distinguish between the different uh, supposedly revolutionary parties. And so what you have is the big name parties, the most well-known parties, are thrust to the front. You have the socialist revolutionaries, you have the Mensheviks who become the leaders of this revolution. Obviously, these parties don't want a socialist revolution, and so they hand power to the revolutionary bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie is terrified of revolution, so they set up a body called the Provisional Government, which is stuffed full of reactionaries. But this revolution does allow many of the old uh, Bolshevik leaders who had been trapped in exile to return to Russia. But the first to return are people like Zinoviev, Kamenev and Stalin. And these leaders really, without Lenin, were completely helpless. But how do we explain that these great leaders of the great revolutionary party were so helpless? Well, let's think. Look, any political party needs an apparatus, and this apparatus needs to carry out routines. But it can happen that the members of this apparatus begin only to think about these organizational questions. And that can lead to quite a narrow type of thinking. And so that can happen to any revolutionary party, and that needs to be consciously combated with an emphasis on theory. We need all of our comrades to master for themselves the ideas and the method of Marxism, not to be relying on formulas that we've been given or <laughs> messages from the leadership that we follow 100%. Now, we need all of our comrades to have the capacity to think. <coughs> but unfortunately, that uh, capacity wasn't uh, possessed by some of these leaders of the Bolsheviks. So after his return in April uh, 1917, Stalin begins uh, to lay out the perspective for the Bolsheviks. And he says, look, we should support this provisional government so long as it strengthens uh, the revolution. And we should avoid repelling the bourgeoisie, so we need to hold back the workers. He was following Lenin's old formula to the line. 
But this provisional government was tied to foreign imperialism, so it would never bring about peace and end to the war. It was made up of landowners, so it would never be able to deal with the land. It essentially supported the status quo, so it could never also provide bread. It could basically answer none of the questions of the movement. And so you see, at this stage, the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, under the leadership of those who were present, basically stood for the same thing. And so unsurprisingly, if you consider that, you have Stalin begin to advocate for unity of the Mensheviks and Bolsheviks. You think, so much for Trotsky the Menshevik. But I think this all reveals, really, that Trotsky was correct, that the Bolshevik theory would be shown to be reactionary after a revolution. Now, if you look at pictures of Lenin, you can see that he went bald very young in life. And I think that's no surprise, really, when you see what he had to deal with. Because Lenin was never one to just rigidly stick to an old formula. A theory is a hypothesis about reality. If reality starts contradicting that hypothesis, well, you need a new theory. And that is exactly what Lenin did at this time. His letter on tactics, for example, which is an excellent document, he says, the Bolshevik slogans had been proven correct on the whole, but things had turned out differently to what we expected. So we urged his comrades to adapt his schemas to the facts instead of reiterating the now meaningless words about the dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry in general. When he finally was able to return to Russia, he basically went to war against the entire leadership of his party. At a congress in April, he explains that the conditions for socialism are not present in Russia, but they are on a world scale. He said the Russian Revolution wasn't an independent act, but it was part of a world revolution. So the Russian workers could take power, they could begin to transform the economy on socialist lines, um, and that would give a powerful impulse to the world revolution. You could say, and many Bolsheviks at that time did say, that Lenin had become a Trotskyist. Even his wife, Krupskaya, said, um, I am worried it looks as if Lenin has gone crazy. But yeah, so Lenin had to fight this battle, and it's shown that even by the time of the eve of the October Revolution, Kamenev and Zinoviev publicly reveal all of the plans for the revolution. And Lenin is absolutely furious, and he demands that these two are expelled from the party. And what does Stalin do? Well, he declares his solidarity with these two, and he actually criticizes Lenin for his sharp tone. Now, the test of any theory is practice, and I think that the experience of the Russian Revolution proves the theory of the permanent revolution. First, in the context of a revolution, the bourgeoisie oppose even the minimum demands. The nationalizations that were carried out really were not part of any uh, overall plan, but were done in response to actions from the bourgeoisie. The workers weren't satisfied with limiting their demands to bourgeois democratic demands. It's a slogan for workers' control of industry. It didn't actually come from the Bolsheviks, but it came from the factory committees, from the workers themselves. Yeah. And third, it required the workers to come to power in order to carry out the bourgeois democratic revolution. Para. Lenin said, We solved the problems of the bourgeois democratic revolution in passing, as a byproduct of our main and genuinely proletarian revolution. He said that this, uh, this revolution is proof of, uh, of how the one revolution develops into the other. That's Lenin, the Trotskyist, not Trotsky. Now, in 1917, over the course of the events, Trotsky becomes a celebrated leader of the Bolsheviks. He was one of, two of, the, he was one of the two key figures of the revolution, alongside Lenin. Just to get a picture of this, comrades can read 10 Days That Shook the World, which was written shortly after the revolution. You can barely read a page without Lenin or Trotsky being mentioned, and Stalin barely appears at all. And Lenin wrote an introduction to this uh, book, which he explained was an accurate portrayal of the events. So Trotsky's theory really should have become a guide to action for how communists behave in countries similar to Russia. Um, you, you can see with the uh, first few com congresses of the Communist International, the speeches that are given, where essentially Lenin advises the parties to follow this line. But what happened? Well, obviously, so the Bolsheviks had taken power in an isolated and devastated country. 
to get out of the First World War, they were forced to sign the Brest-Litovsk Treaty. This meant they had to give up a huge amount of land. They lost three quarters of their iron production, 90% of their wheat. I could go on, there's a lot of statistics. <laughs> Very soon after getting out of that war, they're invaded by 21 of the most powerful countries in the world all at once. And when this happens, the, the, it's the Russian Civil War, who does Lenin turn to? He turns to Trotsky. And Trotsky basically builds a brand new army from scratch and manages to fight off these armies. The writer Maxim Gorky says of a discussion he had with Lenin at this time that Lenin thumped the table and said Trotsky is capable of miracles. But whilst the Bolsheviks were victorious, the civil war was very punishing on them. Over the course of the war, it meant that the Red Army was basically absorbing half of all industrial production. Giving up all uh, you know, this land with this wheat meant uh, there was huge pressure on food production. You had the emergence of famine, you had epidemics. So this was an absolutely desperate situation, and they had to resort to desperate measures, which came to be known as war communism. This involved sweeping nationalizations, not due to the objective needs of the economy, but just to hang on for dear life, really. They were forced to ration food, and in order to try and feed the workers in the cities, they had to forcibly take grain off the peasants. But this immense social crisis meant that production was collapsing. And so this meant that they were unable to give anything in exchange to the peasants for that food. Things like uh, tractors, things to improve their uh, production of food. Now you can imagine if someone's constantly taking all of your grain that you're producing, you're going to get and not giving anything in return, you're going to become alienated. And so unsurprisingly, you had things like hoarding, hiding of food by the peasants. Clearly, this could only ever be a temporary policy. They needed the spreading of the revolution, and you can Im only imagine what could have happened if the revolutions in Germany had been successful. Quite apart from taking back a lot of the land, <laughs> um, they would have had the um, much more advanced technique and technology that the German state could provide. So you could have combined these vast natural resources with uh, the technology from Germany in order to rapidly develop the economy. Now, of course, this didn't happen, so therefore some other, uh, something else was needed. And Trotsky, in this context, was the first to think of some sort of different policy. He argued, well, in order to revive the economy, it was, it was necessary to make some retreats. You needed to replace this uh, seizing of grain with, uh, with a tax on grain, and you needed to restore uh, the exchange of commodities. Since the international revolution was being delayed, well, you needed to uh, restore kind of personal incentives for the peasants to get them producing. But unfortunately, these proposals were defeated at the Central Committee. So then Trotsky thought, OK, well, look, if we're going to keep war communism, well, let's do it properly. He said, well, look, we're basically living in a society where all of the resources are nationalised and just distributed by the government. And so he said, well, in this situation, the trade unions are not necessary. He was basically theorising a way to use military discipline to get more out of the masses. Now, Lenin opposed this. He argued that trade unions are necessary even in a worker state. Because dialectically, by protecting the workers from the state, you also protect the state from the state. But with this debate, what ended up happening is nothing changed. And so for a year following, you only had the problems getting worse. And by the next Congress, Lenin had realised, OK, we do need to make a change here. And it was here that the new economic policy was, pro was proposed. And this was a set of measures that were very similar to what Trotsky had proposed a year earlier, and so he supported them. Now, this all seems very reasonable if you don't know the history, because in the interests of the faction fight between Stalin and Trotsky later, this debate was dragged up out of all context. And Trotsky is presented as a dictator who just wanted to ban the trade unions just out of nowhere. It's very helpful, obviously, for Stalinists to make an equivalent with, uh, <laughs> with uh, Stalin, but it bears no resemblance to facts. Anyway, so at this time, the, uh, many workers were being sent to the front to fight in the Civil War. You had workers fleeing the cities to find food in the villages. You had uh, workers killed in uh, famine or epidemics. So just to give you some figures, in, in 1917, Russia had 3 million industrial workers. 
By 1922, this had fallen to 1.2 million. And Lenin began thinking, oh, well, look, the working class is becoming declassed. On top of this, to deal with this crisis, they had to extend the working day. And that meant that the workers who were left in the cities had less time to participate in the Soviets, to participate in the state. You know, Soviets are not magic things. They, they rely on the active participation of the working class. Without this, they can begin to wither. Now, you've also got to consider that at the time that the Bolsheviks took power, a huge proportion of the population couldn't even read. And so the, the new Bolshevik power had to rely on a lot of the old czarist officials to fill the positions of the state. Uh, just to give an example, I mean, and also, obviously, many of these people were not exactly in favour of the new regime. So there was a 1922 survey of 270 engineers that found 9% of them supported the state. As well as these officials, you did have workers who were being drawn into the state, but then increasingly divorced from the working class. Now, all of these factors together, then, allowed a bureaucracy to basically gradually rise itself on, uh, on top of society. Lenin recognised this, and he took up the fight against it. He said, you scratch the surface of our state, and you see the same old czarist state underneath. He said as well that there were communists who were becoming bureaucrats. You imagine, after taking power, uh, the mem membership of the Bolshevik party, it was no longer a path to the hangman's noose. It was pa a path to a quite comfortable job, relatively speaking. And so Lenin uh, mounted a campaign to kick out all of the careerists out of the party, in his words. Now, unfortunately, Lenin died in 1924. But even if Lenin had lived, it would not have been possible uh, to stop this process without an international revolution. What we saw was not a struggle of individuals, it was a struggle of social forces that expressed itself through individuals. The working class was gradually losing power because of this immense pressure that was on it. And as that happened, this bureaucracy was growing in strength and beginning to have interests of its own and beginning to look for a leader for itself. So it was in this context that this bitter factional fight broke out. You have people like Zinoviev and Kamenev, who were very jealous of, uh, of Trotsky, forming an alliance with Stalin. <clears throat> Because Stalin had not played much of a role, really, in the party, these two uh, figures actually underestimated him. But Stalin actually was the perfect leader for the bureaucracy as a caste. He really was an empiricist with not, uh, not far-sighted uh, view. Um, and so he was you know, perfectly capable to be used, basically, by the bureaucracy. And so after Lenin died, this faction fight basically breaks out into the open. A huge number of old debates between Lenin and Trotsky are dragged up totally out of context to try and denigrate Trotsky. And this was all actually revealed later when Zinoviev and Kamenev for a time came over to Trotsky's side. They said there was basically a special kind of careerism was formed where anyone who was in favour of this troika was promoted. Over time, they tried to scrub out Trotsky's name from anything that was good and uh, implant Stalin's. Just as one example, in 1934, uh, you still had the revolution relatively fresh in people's minds, and Stalin wrote something. Can I quote this? You just, okay, don't. He said, All practical work in connection with the organisation of the uprising was done under the immediate direction of Comrade Trotsky. In 1953, obviously memories had faded a bit by then, and the same text was edited. And so Stalin said that Trotsky played no particular role in the October insurrection. One of these uh, so-called theoretical debates, which we still uh, have to deal with today, is over the question of socialism in one country. Uh, there's a man named Harpal Bra, who is a Stalinist from Britain, and he explains this. He said, at the time of the Russian Revolution, all the revolutionaries expected the revolution to spread internationally. He thinks he's clever here. He says, look, since this didn't happen, you're left with two options. Either you give up and surrender, or instead you decide to build socialism in Russia. Now, this is mad. This is basically, you present what kind of revolution you want purely as being, you know, depending on your subjective will. 
It's like when uh, you go down to the beach to lie on one of these uh, benches. It's like, what, what ice cream should I have? You know, at the time, did they want an international revolution or a national revolution? I don't know, what, what do you fancy? Internationalism, it's not a, you know, a verbal flourish or, you know, a rhetoric. A lone island of a worker's state would always come under immense pressure from global capitalism. And that's especially so when you consider what Russia was like back then. For a socialist society, to, for a worker's state to survive, it would, be more, it would need to be more economically advanced than the most advanced capitalist society. If not, it would come under immense pressure, not just from bullets and bombs, but from cheap goods from capitalist society. Just look at what happened when they tried to introduce workers' control. This is in the context of a low level of development and a low cultural level of the working class. It wasn't some utopia. You had uh, cases of workers teaming up with their bosses to just uh, divide up the stock of the factory and just sell it all off and divide it amongst themselves. You had uh, other cases of just uh, factories deciding to give themselves huge wage increases. There was no overall coordination possible, so you had cases of factories just competing against other factories in a chaotic way. All of this is demonstration, really, of what Marx once said when he said that law can never be higher than the economic structure of society and its cultural development conditioned hereby. You know, you can legislate for things like workers' control, um, but if the economy is at a, at a low level, it won't work. What was needed was the spread of the revolution internationally. Socialism in one country was against the entire uh, tradition of Marxism. If you get the uh, book In Defense of Lenin, it has an appendix in it. And that's 10 pages long of quotes from Lenin opposing the idea that it's possible to build socialism in one country. The whole basis for this uh, supposed theory comes from one article that Lenin wrote once in 1915 um, on the slogan of the United States of Europe. Now, first of all, this was written in 1915, before the Russian Revolution. But also, if you read it carefully, what you can see is that he is arguing against this idea that it is necessary for revolutions to happen everywhere all at once for a revolution to be successful. He is not arguing that you can build a fully-fledged socialist or communist uh, economy in one country on its own. Now, linked to the theory of socialism in one country is the stagist theory of revolutions. This was an attempt, basically, to divide the revolutionary process into self-contained stages. So the idea is in a, in a less advanced uh, country, what you need, first of all, is a revolution that overthrows feudalism and imperialism. Then once that's happened and that's completely done with, later, sometime in the future, you can have another separate socialist revolution. Now, comrades, remember, this has nothing to do with what even Lenin wrote before 1917. What this is, it's a revival of the Menshevik theory of revolution. Now, Harpal Bra again, um, he said that the proof as to whose theory is correct is the fact that uh, the USSR survived for seven decades. Now, I'm not sure if Harpal Bra has been asleep since 1990 and has just woken up, but unfortunately, of course, the USSR collapsed. Now, the history of this, uh, of this period does show what can be achieved if capitalism is overthrown. Russia was transformed from a, a backward economy to one that was capable of competing with the uh, United States. But what you had was that over time, this bureaucracy, which at first was a relative fetter on development, eventually was transformed to an absolute fetter on development. No matter how intelligent they are, it really it is impossible for a bureaucracy to plan an economy. You need certain signals in order to determine what is to be produced. Under capitalism, with limitations, to some extent, that uh, function is fulfilled by supply and demand, the price measure. But under a worker state, what is necessary then is workers' democracy to fulfill that function. So the USSR did eventually collapse under the weight of its own contradictions. It was the collapse of a worker state, but it was not the collapse of communism or socialism. And so I'd say that this actually is the final proof of the correctness of the theory of the permanent revolution. Because the revolution fa uh, failed to spread, it eventually collapsed. Now, actually, socialism in one country um, and the stagist theory of uh, revolutions are really not theories at all. 
they're not honest hypotheses about uh, future revolutionary developments. They are a reflection of the mentality of the bureaucracy at the time when they were formulated. This was, uh, the, the bureaucracy was a caste that was relatively privileged in Russian society. And so they'd uh, become tired of the kind of uh, storm and stress of world revolution. In the back of their minds as well was the worry that uh, a, a revolution elsewhere could spark the Russian workers into action again. And that then would threaten their own power and privileges. So instead of pursuing a policy of class independence, they advocated for communist parties around the world to make alliances with so-called progressive bourgeoisies. In China, in India, in uh, Indonesia, sorry, in many countries, this led to historic defeats. Now, obviously, Trotsky did not take this lying down. In 1923, formed the left opposition to try and fight for the genuine ideas of Marxism. And step by step, they predicted the line of march of events. <coughs> In China, for example, they predicted that the use of the stage theory, uh, the, the abandonment of class independence would lead to defeats. And after being proven correct, you had a young member of the left opposition who's full of enthusiasm and he came to speak to Trotsky. He said, look, well, you know, we've been proven right. Surely this will bring, thousands, this will bring uh, the masses onto our side. But Trotsky explained, yeah, this could bring some uh, kind of advanced workers over to our side, but it has a completely different effect on the masses. For the masses, the effect of a defeated international revolution, that really lowers their confidence in their own power. So that makes them less active and it makes them less of a check on the bureaucracy. And so you had a series of international defeats due to the policies of the Stalinists, but in a contradictory way that actually strengthened their position internally. And so by the mid-1930s, you have the Stalinists feeling confident enough to properly wipe out the whole leadership of the old Bolshevik. They carry out a series of show trials called the uh, Moscow Trials, and uh, they use them to execute huge numbers of the old leadership. Now, there is one, I don't really want to call him a historian, but person who uh, Stalinists online you might come across use to prove that Trotsky was a fascist and the Moscow trials were totally fair. I'm running out of time and I don't want to waste your time, so I'll only give one example of what Grover Fur uses to prove that Trotsky was a fascist. Um, I must like self-punishment because I read his book. <laughs> After a long, long, tiring, poorly written build-up, the first bit of evidence that he uses to prove Trotsky's fascist credentials. Leon Trotsky once wrote a telegraph to the Central Executive Committee when he was in exile, which pointed out that their policy was leading to collapse. Stalin intercepted this note and wrote, ugly spy, brazen spy of Hitler. Now, I'm not joking, you can read it for yourself. This is proof, according to Grover Fur, that, Stal uh, that Trotsky was a fascist. because Stalin wrote it and it wasn't intended for publication. Now, I won't waste your time. I have other examples, but I'm running out of time, so <laughs> to save us all. <clears throat> but anyway, what we can say, I think, is that the, the Moscow trials, this uh, execution of the entire old Bolshevik uh, leadership, this is proof that there is a complete difference. There is nothing in common between Stalinism and communism. Now, Leon Trotsky was murdered by the Stalinists in 1940. And much like the Bolsheviks without Lenin, the group that was around Trotsky proved hopeless without Trotsky. Again, they'd not mastered the method of Marxism. They just took quotes of what Trotsky had said once and rigidly applied it to everything. And eventually this group split up into hundreds and hundreds of different so-called Trotskyist sects. <coughs> The sole purpose of them seems to me at least just to be to blacken Trotsky's name. But some of what they say is uh, often criticized by Stalinists as being Trotskyism. <coughs> so you might hear sometimes that Stalinists will say that Trotskyists dismiss the achievements of actually existing socialism. But what evidence do they use for this? 
Well, you do have uh, organisations such as that around uh, Tony Cliff whilst he was alive. They ended up arguing things like the USSR was no longer a worker state, it had become state capitalist. Really, this was nothing but a, a moralistic position. They saw the bad things happening in the USSR and didn't want to be associated with it. A scientific approach would have defined it as a worker state where the workers have lost political power. It's a, an analogy with uh, Pinochet's Chile. That was a capitalist state where the capitalists had lost political power. Anyway, this moralistic approach essentially ended up with them uh, describing the collapse of the USSR as not a step backwards at all. Despite the immense crisis that this brought about, they described it as nothing but a step sideways. Now, the point is that these organisations completely abandoned the theory of Trotsky. Trotsky continually explained how the uh, state in the USSR was a worker's state, but one that had degenerated. <laughs> And we do celebrate the achievements that were uh, brought about by the abolition of capitalism. These achievements, though, were achieved despite the bureaucracy, not because of it. But rather than uh, this being a sad story, actually it should inspire us. If all these achievements were possible in Russia, just imagine what could happen if we were able to take power in Italy, in Britain, in a more advanced capitalist country. Now, the ideas of Lenin and Trotsky are very much alive today. But we should look back to the kind of uh, atmosphere that the leaders of the left opposition faced when they were fighting. <laughs> they were crushed between, on the one hand, this monstrous Stalinist state, and on the other, the might of world imperialism. Despite everything, they remained confident in the ideas of Marxism and the power of the working class. When they were imprisoned and they were marched out of their camps in Siberia, being marched to their death, they marched out singing the Internationale because they had not lost confidence. Now, Trotsky and uh, his comrades fought this fight not because they expected to win back power. They fought to preserve the, gen the ideas of genuine Leninism. But they understood that this could only be done through an open struggle for ideas, despite the personal consequences that might bring. Really, they are our brave comrades. And we owe them an immense debt of gratitude. But we live in a completely different world now. They really were fighting a losing battle at that stage. But now, the tide is turning. And so it's up to us, really, all of us, to study, to conquer the genuine ideas of communism. The genuine ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky. Because it's with those that we can build a powerful organisation that can lead the working class to victory everywhere. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack, for that uh, excellent introduction to the discussion. So uh, the first speaker now will be uh, Stamatis from the Greek section. Comrades, one of Lenin's ideas that have been most abused by apologists of Stalinism is his view on the slogan of the United States of Europe. In trying to extract from Lenin's writings phrases supporting the abomination of socialism in one country and extract uh, the impression that Lenin uh, had irreconcilable uh, differences uh, with uh, Trotsky, Stalinists, Stalinists for decades distort an article of Lenin written in uh, 1915 entitled on the slogan of the United States of Europe in the paper Social Democrat, uh, which at that time Lenin personally edited, giving it a Bolshevik line. So at the time when this article by Lenin was written, Trotsky was uh, writing a series of articles uh, in uh, his uh, Paris paper, Nasus Lovo, and could take. So to defend the theory of the socialism in one country, the Stalinists falsely state that in his own article of 1915, Lenin claims that the United States of Europe is a reactionary slogan in general reactionary in general. That is, both in the case of the capitalist United States, but also in the case of the United Soviet Socialist States of Europe. But whoever reads the article understands the exact opposite. There, Lenin characterized only capitalist European unification as reactionary. 
he specifically opposed a, a uh, unification of Europe that will take place from the point of view of the uh, economic, economic conditions of imperialism, as Lenz right, and emphasizes that the United States of Europe, under capitalist conditions, <coughs> is equivalent to an agreement to share the colonies. And what was Lenin's attitude about the other, qualitatively different version of the slogan, namely the United States uh, of Soviet, uh, the, the United uh, Soviet States of Europe? He certainly did not reject this in general and for reasons of principle, but uh, he considered uh, wrong. He considered uh, wrong strictly from uh, the point of view of tactics and in the specific uh, juncture of uh, 1915. And the reason is that uh, this particular period, at the uh, beginning of the First World War, Lenin was afraid that the slogan might create the impression that the necessary proletarian revolution, which will put an end to the imperialist war, should begin simultaneously in the whole European continent. But on this issue, Trotsky has no disagreement with Lenin. He wrote on the same period uh, in uh, Nasser's Lobo, in the series of uh, articles uh, I mentioned, that no country should wait for the others in its struggle. We start and continue the struggle of the uh, on the national soil, but, but with the full certainty that our initiative will give an impetus to the struggle of other countries. And of course, the best proof that uh, Lenin did not reject this slogan in general and as a matter of principle, as the Stalinists claimed and still claim, is the fact that this particular slogan was officially adopted by the entire Communist International in 1923. And it was, in essence, a fully Leninist slogan, which was officially promoted by all sections of the Comintern before uh, the rise of Stalinism, and we typically find it in official documents of section of the Comintern, such as, for example, in the statement of Kukwe for May Day 1940, uh, 1924, which called for the United Soviet uh, States of Europe. But, but this slogan was thrown into the garbage bin by the leadership of the Comintern as the Stalinist degeneration uh, of the Soviet Union and of the uh, Comintern developed. And officially, the slogan was abandoned with the program adopted by the 6th Congress of Comintern in uh, 1928. Significantly, uh, the draft program written by Bukharin and signed, and signed by him and uh, Stalin was uh, presented only a few weeks before the Congress without having, without having time to be discussed at all uh, in the national sections and in their press, without even having, without even having a substantial editing of the uh, document, of the text, not proofreading, even proofreading. So the main argument of the Stalinists for the rejection of the slogan of the United Socialist States of Europe was and continue to be, until today, the law of uneven development between the different European states. Trotsky, responding to this argument, in a document uh, criticizing the program of the Comintern in 1928, uh, expl explained that the an uneven development of the various states of Europe cannot be interpreted uh, in an absolute and uh, absolute and unelastic uh, manner because the historical and geographical conditions determined for the uh, states of Europe an organic relevance and connection so essential that cannot in any way escape from it. And he explained that this relevance and connection between European states creates the phenomenon of pan-European pan -European dynamics that the proletarian revolution will have when it breaks out in a European country. And he emphasized that the slogan of the United Soviet States of Europe specific, specifically responds to this dynamic. For example, he wrote, the revolution in Germany has historically proven to have an immediate, enormous importance and effect on France. And he noted that it was no coincidence that the slogan of the United Soviet States of Europe was adopted by the Comintern precisely in 1923, 
when the outbreak of revolution uh, uh, in Germany was expected. By the way, uh, it is worth saying that Lenin, in his uh, 1915 article, did not rule out the possibility of creating a capitalist U European Union uh, with the same reactionary nature uh, as the current capitalist EU, argued that uh, it will be the result of a temporary, however, agreement between European capitalists in order to jointly suppress socialism in uh, Europe and to jointly uh, protect the colonial spoils against Japan and America. So to conclude, comrades, today, at the time when the capitalist EU uh, and Eurozone exist on an uh, economical and monetary agreement, as an economic and monetary agreement of the European capitalists, not as temporary as they might have predicted in 1915 by Lenin and Trotsky, but, but around a common program of pan-European attack on the living standards of the working class, and at a time when uh, the developed economic connections of capitalist Europe has multiplied the common organic relevance and connection between the European states of which Trotsky spoke, but also at the time when colossal capitalist competition and constantly are constantly undermining the co this connection, the slogan of the United Social States of Europe is more relevant than ever, and must be our slogan must be a basic slogan for the communist today. Thank you very much, Stamatis. I should have mentioned that the next speaker will be Joe Attard from the International Centre, and Joe will be followed by Bryce from the USA. The Stalinist bureaucracy attacked the theory of permanent revolution because it embodied the authentic legacy of October, which their counter-revolution had to bury so that they might secure their positions. And modern Stalinists take rubbish from the 20s about Trotsky underestimating the peasantry, They combine it with petty bourgeois identity politics from academia and create allegations that Trotsky was racist. So that Marxist-Leninist academic Robert Beale writes, the Eurocentric view in its most extreme form is represented by Trotsky. He held that the future of the revolution depended on what happened in Europe. Terrible. In contrast to Lenin's revolutionary faith in the peoples of the East. Well, I'm sorry, Comrade Robert, but Lenin was a racist too then. Because while he did indeed support the notion of revolution everywhere, he had plenty of faith in the peoples of the East and throughout the world. He was crystal clear that the survival of the Russian Revolution depended on revolution in the advanced capitalist countries. And actually, before 1917, Trotsky alone argued that the workers of poor and backward Russia were not only capable of taking power before their Western counterparts, but destined to. Now, Jack dealt with how the collapse of the USSR is living proof of the bankruptcy of socialism in one country. There are many other examples. And how the Stalinist so-called theory of stages was put immediately to the test in China in 1926 and 1927. Although they actually went even further than the Mensheviks, because Stalin told the communists in China to dissolve themselves into the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party. It would have been like telling the Bolsheviks to dissolve themselves into the cadets. He told them to curb the peasant struggle, to not raise Soviets. And the leader of the Kuomintang, who the Stalinists called a reliable ally, Chiang Kai-shek, launched a white terror that ultimately killed a million people in 1927. It destroyed the communists. And the mistake was replicated twice because then the Stalinists told the communists to join um, the Wuhan government, which split off from the Kuomintang, who also turned around and crushed the communists. Hunts for progressive bourgeois allies yielded similarly disastrous results in many places, as Jack mentioned, including India, actually, for the same reason that everywhere the bourgeoisie had exhausted its progressive role. And this is doubly true in poor, oppressed nations. A positive example of permanent revolution in action can be seen in the Cuban Revolution. Not because its leaders ever accepted Trotsky's ideas, but because the dynamics of the revolution proved them in practice. 
Castro and the July 26 movement initially intended to carry out a national bourgeois revolution of liberation against the Batista dictatorship and the dominance of US imperialism behind it in alliance with the so-called progressive national bourgeoisie. But after overthrowing Batista in 1959, the new regime tried to carry out its program, its national bourgeois democratic program, and particularly where it concerned the agrarian question, the national bourgeoisie showed their true colors. They moved into the counter-revolutionary camp, and while the revolution nationalized US property on the island in 1960, the parasitic local Cuban bourgeoisie actively collaborated with the imperialists to destroy the revolution. So Cuba and the regime, Castro and the regime, were forced to radicalize as a matter of expediency, and that strengthened the revolution. <coughs> it strengthened the real forces of the revolution, the workers and the peasantry culminating in the expropriation of capitalism and the amazing achievements that were accomplished by economic planning subsequently. Now, the dangers faced by the Cuban Revolution today also confirm Trotsky's theory in the negative you know, and the impossibility of building socialism within a single country. I don't have time to deal with this. But if that's a positive example, in the last decade, the revolutions and counter-revolutions in the Middle East and Africa are a terribly negative one. And it goes to show the permanent revolution, it's not a debate, it's not a question confined to the 20s. It has profound relevance to the struggle today. In 2018, the people of Sudan launched a tremendous revolution against the military dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir. The Sudanese Communist Party had a certain tradition, but it already exposed itself in the 60s, supporting movements and coups, standing, they said, for all elements of Sudanese society. A Stalinist popular front, essentially. And these bourgeois elements, these reactionary elements, went on to murder and imprison and disappear communist and working class activists. So in 2018, the Communist Party was leapt over by the Sudanese Professionals Association, the SPA. It was basically a white collar body. Um, it was led by teachers, lawyers, this, these sorts of people. And for a time, it fought courageously it called huge general strikes that at certain points had almost the entire country involved. The regime was suspended in the air. At the same time, powerful neighborhood defense committees, Soviets in all but name, sprung up across the country. And even when the junta unleashed the RSF, uh, extremely reactionary tribal militiamen, to inflict a terror on the masses, it actually drove the revolution forward. The workers were not absent. It's no coincidence the protests began in Atbara, which is the base for the railway union, which is the biggest union in Sudan. But the proletariat never decisively claimed the leadership of the revolution. It was inherited instead accidentally by the SPA, a heterogeneous body. It didn't expropriate the junta. It didn't expropriate the bourgeois. It didn't go after the imperialists and their um, enclaves of support in the country or their resources and use that to create a program of social reform to galvanize the workers and the poor. It was full of liberal illusions. It refused to arm the masses or reach out to the armed forces, the lower ranks of which were wavering. In the end, it essentially handed power back to the hunter. And today, two wings of the counter-revolution are fighting one another over the corpse of the revolution. And in a final betrayal, the Communist Party has backed the old military leadership over the militia in the name of order, as a lesser evil, in effect. So just to summarize, the permanent revolution is more relevant today than when it was conceived over 100 years ago. The crisis of capitalism will create many revolutionary situations in the underdeveloped countries. But even in the most advanced capitalist countries, revolution cannot be confined to a single border. And communists today must arm themselves with the theory of permanent revolution and wage a relentless battle against Stalinist revisionism, because that's what it is. 
their mechanical, undialectical, and nationalist view of how revolutions are conducted. As Trotsky said, in order that the proletariats of the eastern countries may open the road to victory, the pedantic reactionary theory of Stalin on stages and steps must be eliminated at the very outset, must be cast aside, broken up, and swept away with a broom. Comrades, let the revolutionary communist international be that broom. Thank you, Joe. I'm now going to call on uh, Bryce from the US section and then Pepe from the Italian section. Well, in 1846, two years before the Communist Manifesto was published, Marx was developing and clarifying the ideas of scientific socialism for the first time. And he said the following about a communist society. A development of the productive forces is the absolutely necessary practical premise because without it, want is generalized. And with want, the struggle for necessities begins again, and that means all the old crap must revive. In other words, he's saying socialism must start from a basis of high economic, technological, and industrial development <clears throat> in order to eliminate want by producing an abundance of the necessities of life. This is one of the most fundamental ideas of Marxism. But Marx never developed that specific angle of the question further. That is the question of building a socialist society in the context of generalized want. Because he expected the revolution to begin in the advanced capitalist countries and spread outward from there. Lenin gave a detailed elaboration on the transition from capitalism to communism in his book, State and Revolution. But he also never explicitly dealt with this question in a theoretical sense because he expected the revolution to spread from Russia into Europe within a relatively short space of time. In fact, in 1921, he remarked that the Russian revolution had been isolated for substantially longer than the Bolsheviks had expected. In hindsight, we know that the revolution was defeated everywhere else, of course, and the Soviet Union became isolated. Lenin died in 1924 and did not live to see that process of isolation continue to play out. And so the task fell to Trotsky to analyze and intervene in this development. In his book, The Revolution Betrayed, Trotsky applied Lenin's basic ideas from state and revolution to this unexpected situation, to the situation of a proletarian revolution in a backwards country in a prolonged period of isolation. <clears throat> and he explained that capitalist anarchy certainly creates the, uh, the struggle of each against all, the struggle for individual existence, but socializing the means of production does not automatically remove this struggle. The economy must be able to actually provide the necessary goods and services in abundance and in that way eliminate the struggle and create the conditions for a transition to communism. And if that is not the case, distortions will inevitably emerge. As Trotsky put it, when there are enough goods in a store, the purchasers can come whenever they want to. When there are few goods, the purchasers must stand in line. When the lines become very long, it is necessary to appoint a policeman to keep order. And he explains that's the starting point of the power of the Soviet bureaucracy. And this situation was exactly what the Soviet Union faced in the 1920s and 30s. After the devastation of World War I and the Russian Civil War. And in the context of Russia's backwards, undeveloped economy. The economy was not able to provide high living standards for everyone. Such a scenario poses the question, who gets what? And the state officials, many of whom were taken from the, Zara, the pre previous Tsarist state, essentially came to manage the, this situation in their own benefit. This was a bureaucracy of several million state officials that went far beyond the leadership of the Bolshevik party. So it wasn't a question of subjective will, but objective forces and objective scarcity in society. And so this led to a situation of highly unequal standards of living. <clears throat> Despite significant gains from the revolution, the absolute uh, level of living standards of the masses was still far below the advanced capitalist countries. Children of workers and peasants lacked milk, lacked food. The per capita production of shoes in the Soviet Union in the 30s was below one. Not everyone had shoes. And the masses subsisted largely on potatoes and rye bread. Meanwhile, the privileged Soviet officials had cars, large apartments, and higher quality food. And so there was a significant gulf. And this growth of bureaucracy was a process. It didn't emerge overnight. It started developing in the early years of the Soviet Union, but reached a tipping point after Lenin's death. 
And so while Lenin died before he could analyze this question theoretically, he was clearly aware of this problem and deeply concerned by it. It was an existential threat to the existence of the Soviet state. It was a threat to the success of the world socialist revolution. And so his final political struggle was against this growing bureaucracy. To give just one example, you can look at his, the speech he gave to the fourth Congress of the Communist International in 1922. <coughs> Lenin was quite ill by this time. He was only able to give one speech at this whole Congress, and so he chose his words carefully. And in this speech, he, gave, uh, he essentially gave warnings to the comrades of the Communist International, uh, problems to keep in mind. One of them was the problem of precisely the Russian state apparatus. And he said the following about that. We took over the old machinery of state, and that was our misfortune. Very often, this machinery operates against us. In 1917, after we seized power, the government officials sabotaged us. This frightened us very much, and we pleaded, please come back. They all came back, but that was our misfortune. And he, he went on to describe the role that the state officials are playing, the, the vast majority of the lower uh, ranks of the state officials. He said, down below, there are hundreds of thousands of old officials whom we got from the czar and from bourgeois society, and who partly deliberately and partly unwittingly work against us. And so it's clear to the end of his life, Lenin always told the bitter truth about the situation in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> Later in the 1920s, the Stalinists would evoke moralistic arguments against uh, Trotsky and the left opposition. They would say that the left opposition lacks inner faith in the revolution and these kinds of arguments. But that's not a serious argument. It's not a materialist argument. It's a, uh, if, if taken at face value, it's essentially a utopian socialist argument. And it's in complete contrast to Lenin's method, which was to, again, to, to tell the truth, no matter how bitter it may be. And of course, while making these warnings, Lenin was also continually emphasizing the ultimate solution to the problems facing the Soviet Union. He was not vague about it at all. He said in 1922, just for one example, we have not finished building even the foundations of socialist economy, and the hostile powers of moribund capitalism can still deprive us of that. We must clearly appreciate this and frankly admit it, because there's nothing more dangerous than illusions. Uh, for, and he went on to say, we have always urged and reiterated the elementary truth of Marxism, that the joint efforts of the workers of several advanced countries are needed for the victory of socialism. So this defense of internationalism and the assertion of a bureaucracy in the Soviet state were not unique to Trotsky. It's all one unbroken thread of Marxism from Marx, Engels, to Lenin, to Trotsky. Trotsky heroically maintained the flame of genuine Marxism after Lenin's death, and he preserved genuine Marxism for this generation, for our generation, to rebuild the forces of international communism and carry out the successful World Socialist Revolution. Okay, I'm going to bring in Pepe now, and then uh, from Italy, and then I'm going to abuse the position of chair and uh, speak myself briefly. Well, comrades, um, when uh, we speak about uh, Lenin and Trotsky, what they really stood for, and uh, the difference between uh, Lenin and uh, Leninism and Stalinism, it's very relevant uh, to address uh, the fundamentally different approach on the national question. We have always to remember, sorry. We always to remember that the handling, the correct handling of the national question was a, a key factor for the success of the October Revolution. Para, para Victoria della Revolution de October. De October. Uh, we, uh, Lenin described, quite rightly, Russia as a prison of nations where the great Russian nation brutally oppressed the minorities, depriving them of every rights, unleashing pogrom, vicious pogroms uh, over the minorities. So, with the slogan of the right of nation to self-determination, the Bolsheviks were able to gather all the oppressed nation under the banner of Bolshevism. Che con, con, esta, sì, con el, la consigna del derecho de la nación hasta la autodeterminación fue posible por los bolsheviques aglutinar. Ok, vabbè, te lo dicevo in spagnolo. Vabbè, amen. Con, il, con il, lo slogan del diritto de la nación a la autodeterminación è stato posible per i bolsheviques radunare le masse okay, dei popoli oppressi 
sotto la bandiera del comunismo. Puoi decir en español, ma no parece que le gusta. Probamos. Eh, eh, no, eh, what the position of the Bolshevik was clear that a federation of peoples under the socialist uh, society would be the best, for, the best option. But the Bolshevik recognized uh, the history of centuries of oppression and this right uh, for the nation to the, to the, to the self-determination self would mean also to be ready to accept, uh, to accept the secession of the nations. For example, one of the first decrees of the Soviet uh, rule was to grant uh, independence to Finland. Also, uh, to the, uh, the independence was given to the Baltic states. And this uh, was uh, a living memory in the people, uh, between the peoples of the uh, Soviet Union up to the end of the 80s. One of the first movements of the masses in the end of the 80s and the United Soviet Union was the movement of the minorities, of the oppressed nations, of this uh, uh, Soviet Republic to have uh, independence from the Soviet Union. For example, in the Baltic states. What? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, for example, at the end of the 80s, there were these movements in Lithuania with placards with the Lenin image and uh, Lithuania under it, the, the map of Lithuania, under 1920. Then Stalin image with Lithuania map under 1940 and the Stalin uh, image, uh, Stalin uh, photo with a red crossover because we have to remind ourselves that uh, Stalin invaded the Baltic st states in 1940 without asking permission to the Lithuanians, the Latvians, and so on. And then uh, uh, Lithuania uh, map, Gorbachev uh, photo, 1989, and a red cross over Gorbachev, because also Gorbachev was opposed to the right of self-determination. One of the, last, well, the latest struggle of Lenin was on the Georgian questions. In 1921, one of the last uh, chapters of the civil war, the Red Army invaded Georgia. The, in Georgia, the national spirit was very, very relevant. And uh, Lenin always said that uh, uh, the, the Bolshevik uh, in power have to be very patient on the question of uh, the oppressed nation, not to burn them, burn them, sorry, burn them. Instead, the project... Uh, uh, of Stalin about Georgia was to create a Transcaucasic Republic. So uh, a state where uh, Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan were all together. Uh, when the Georgian communists opposed this project, Stalin removed them from power. How many minutes? Okay, okay. I will take less than uh, 15, so I'll give space to you and other people. Uh, I'm not going into details about the way they, they do it. Uh, Stalin and all joint kids. Uh, this was explained in detail in uh, the marvelous book, Lenin and Trotsky, what they really stood for. A masterpiece they read the first time 35 years ago and still uh, is marvelous, marvelous, believe me. Um, but uh, on it, uh, um, on this question, Lenin was quite right. All the, the punishment of all joint kids, uh, they went so far to slap in the face of a Georgian communist. To understand the attitude of Lenin, in one of the latest letters, at the end of uh, 1922, December 1922, Lenin uh, wrote, uh, internationalism on the part of the oppressors of great nations, great inverted commas, as they are called, so they are great only in their violence, only great as bullies, must consist not only in the observance of the former equality of nations, but even in an inequality of the oppression NATO, nation, the great nation. So Lenin went so far to say that the great nation must have less legal rights, 
than uh, oppressed nation. That must make up for the inequality which obtains in actual practice. Anybody who does not understand this has not grasped the real proletarian attitude to the national question and is essentially pitiable in this point of view and is therefore sure to descend to the Bourgeois point of view. So just look at this marvelous world to understand how far Lenin's position was to the ones of uh, uh, Stalin and uh, all the national degeneration of Stalinism throughout the uh, the next years, no, the next decade, decades after Lenin's death. And my last, last thought is that uh, the last uh, one, uh, another last <laughs> later struggle of Lenin is, was, uh, was uh, to stand for a federation of Russia, of equal republic. Stalin wanted a Russian socialist state with autonomies for the nationalities. Lenin uh, fight for, to create uh, the USSR, that at least on legal terms, okay, at legal terms, all the nationality should have the same rights. So imagine, it could have been that not even uh, the USSR, as we know, in the last uh, in decades, would have been born if it was for Stalin. A union that, despite all the weaknesses and blunders and, uh, and flaws, we defend against uh, capitalism and imperialism. And we have to analyze, as we have done here, to understand how to behave, uh, how to uh, go forward uh, in the building of our international, new international that we are launching during this week. It was a liar. Pepe used exactly the 14 minutes that he said he would, not, uh, not a second less. <laughs> After myself, uh, Henry from Britain, uh, I'll bring in. Um, so in January, to uh, celebrate the anniversary of the, uh, the centenary of the death of uh, Lenin, the uh, website In Defense of Communism, not to be confused with In Defense of Marxism, this is the, the English language website of the Greek Communist Party, uh, published an article collecting together all the insults Lenin had ever laid on Trotsky. <laughs> they noted that he'd insulted Trotsky 219 times in his correspondence and writings. <laughs> he'd called him a scoundrel, a Judas, a liar, a political prostitute, and some worse things as well. <laughs> yeah, worse. And that they didn't even bother to give any political... Of course, they didn't give any political context to this. But they didn't even give the dates in which Lenin had uh, used this sort of language. And almost all of these harsh words that Lenin used against Trotsky were written between about 1910 and 1912. Uh, so why was this? Well, uh, I mean, I, I won't go over what uh, Jack explains. Uh, Trotsky had briefly been part of the Menshevik faction. Um, but that ceased to be the case from 1904 onwards. And the 1905 revolution actually showed that Trotsky was politically much closer to Lenin and the Bolsheviks than he was to the Menshevik faction. But the defeat of the 1905 revolution, it led to a crisis of the party. And bear in mind, Mensheviks and Bolsheviks were factions of the same party at that time. Thousands of people left the party, particularly the, the petty bourgeois intellectuals and so forth. Um, and you had moods of despair entering the party, and it reflected itself in, in political trends inside the party. You had, on the one hand, uh, extreme right-wing Mensheviks who were in favor of more or less dissolving the party into just a, a pressure group for the liberals, basically. Uh, they were the liquidators. But you also had an ultra-left sort of uh, tendencies emerging from the Bolshevik faction that were uh, uh, completely detached from reality. They replaced a, a realistic revolutionary program with just very revolutionary sounding phrases. Both Lenin and Trotsky saw the party in crisis and they wanted to preserve the party. Now Trotsky's position was to try to hold all of these disparate elements together and for that reason he was known as a conciliator. Uh, Lenin had completely the contrary position. He wanted to draw a sharp line between these, these opportunist and ultra-left positions and the genuine proletarian core of the party in the Bolshevik faction. And uh, Lenin was right over Trotsky in this. 
And he was proven right in that period, 1910 to 1912, when you had the re-emergence of the class struggle in Russia. 80% of the, uh, of, of the uh, vanguard of the working class came behind the Bolsheviks, and these ultra-lefts and opportunists were, were left in isolation. The workers had learned from the period of 1905. They'd learned the lessons, and uh, Bolshevism was dominant in the labor movement. And in 1912, therefore, Lenin called a, a conference in Prague uh, and the Bolshevik faction to, to break away from all of these ultra-left and opportunist groups to found a real revolutionary party without these people. There, there was nothing, they, they represented no masses. There was nothing to be gained for the revolutionary wing to remain in contact with these opportunists and ultra-lefts that just confused and held the party back. But uh, Trotsky still tried to conciliate these uh, different groups. And in August of uh, 1912, he held a conference in which he invited all factions, including the Bolsheviks. Not only did the Bolsheviks not participate, but Lenin had some very choice words for Trotsky's conciliationism. <laughs> and so Trotsky, who was politically closer to the Bolsheviks, found himself involved in a bloc in which it was him and the ultra-lefts and the opportunists and no one else. It lasted about a year and then it fell apart, of course. Now, in defense of Trotsky, uh, a Bolshevik-type organization, a revolutionary proletarian party like that, had never existed in history. This was new. He wasn't the only person to fail to understand this. Rosa Luxemburg had made the same mistake. The German Revolution paid a bitter price for that. And Stalin didn't understand this in 1912, even though he was a member of the Bolshevik faction. He referred to the splits between Lenin and Trotsky as a storm in a teacup at that time. And he said, let the emigration crawl up the walls. Uh, the important thing is to get on with the work. <laughs> and this is a very practical man, you know, a very practical guy who doesn't care about theory, who understands nothing, in fact, of these controversies. Now, Trotsky recognized his mistake, understood his mistake, and from 1917 onwards, never repeated that. And in fact, Lenin said in 1917, Trotsky long ago said that a unity was impossible. And from that time on, there has been no better Bolshevik. And these insults uh, became of merely historical interest until 1924. <laughs> when they were ripped out of context and used to create this myth of Trotskyism as something separate from Leninism. But in fact, one of the key features that the left opposition was defending against the Stalinist bureaucracy was the independence of the revolutionary party, which they were abandoning in favor of a new conciliationism. They were advocating, as comrades have mentioned, in China in 1925-27, this liquidating the, the Chinese Communist Party. In, uh, uh, prior to the 1926 general strike, Zinoviev, who was in alliance with Stalin, said the following. We do not know exactly whence the Communist Mass Party of Britain will come, whether through the Stuart McManus door, the Stuart McManus door, the Stuart and McManus being leaders of the Communist Party of Britain, or through some other door, by which they mean, meant a, a diplomatic deal with the left bureaucracy of the British trade union movement. So in other words, the, the Stalinist used these quotes when Lenin was denouncing uh, conciliationism on the part of Trotsky precisely to denigrate Trotsky and defend a position of much worse and much, tre much more treacherous conciliationism uh, uh, 10 years later. And that's all. So I'll, I'll bring in uh, Henry now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Lenin and Trotsky fundament on fundamental matters normally were in agreement. Much like the development of Bolshevism itself, however, their relationship was not linear and did not have a perfect development. As Ben just said, Trotsky would sometimes be criticised by Lenin. But this was because, especially after the revolution, he would always be given the most important tasks. For example, building the Red Army. Stalin, on the other hand, was a grey blur. One major point of agreement between Lenin and Trotsky was on the state monopoly of foreign trade. This was a hugely important tool for a very delicate worker's state. Lenin and Trotsky formed a political bloc in Lenin's last years against a growing bureaucracy because they both knew that this monopoly could help avoid foreign capital undermining a very fragile industry. Stalin disagreed with this, but in very vague terms and eventually had to back down. 
Stalin's disagreement with Lenin represented the interests of the growing petty bourgeoisie, the net men. Whereas Lenin and Trotsky had enormous political and moral authority, Stalin really had none at this time. He had to back down, and his manoeuvre was very characteristic of him and the bureaucracy. Lenin, in his final testament, talked about the two most talented members of the Bolshevik CC, excluding himself, obviously. One, he said, could sometimes be a bit too confident, Trotsky. The other, he argued, should be completely removed from his position. This is a big difference. We do have hindsight, but even from an early stage, Stalin's approach to political matters was quite clear. He took an organisational approach always. It is very clear to us that Lenin and Trotsky stood on one side, that of the workers in the October Revolution, and Stalin on the other, the counter-revolution and the bureaucracy. Lenin and Trotsky always made political arguments based on genuine faith in the working class and genuine Marxism. We often talk about how a river of blood separates Stalinism and genuine Bolshevism, and this is because the bureaucracy had to wipe out the original Bolshevik CC. It is because of these crimes against Bolshevism that we have a duty to stand up and openly declare ourselves as genuine Bolsheviks. But Stalinists, as Alan once said, are our cousins nonetheless. They might not be the cousins you were especially close with and went on family holidays with, but rather the ones you found a bit odd. But we must approach them not with scorn, but with raising their sights, as we would do with any, and this is the rank and file, as we would do with any honest reformist worker. This is, of course, on the streets, not online. We have an opportunity, with the collapsing of Stalinist leaderships around the world, to reclaim the genuine traditions of Leninism. Some of our sections already do this, and we can win over the rank and file of these organisations. I wouldn't say this is necessarily a priority, but it is possible. I stand in as an example as a former Stalinist, a member of the Communist Party of Britain, who has won over to our ideas. <laughs> and, and I'm hoping that the, the founding of the RCI will raise that banner high and clear so that more former Stalinists can join our ranks. Thank you. Um, Benjamin from uh, uh, Britain will uh, will now speak for uh, what, ten minutes, maybe twelve minutes, if that's uh, okay. So, yeah, thanks, Jack, for the great lead off and for raising a point that I want to expand a bit upon. That we indeed need to defend the real heritage of Lenin and Trotsky and their real ideas from the Stalinists and from the bourgeois historians, but also from the sects and other so-called Trotskyists. So for, for example, I would uh, take the attitude of some Trotskyist sects uh, towards uh, World War II, and particularly the Revolutionary Socialist League, also called the RSL. They took a very mechanical approach to the situation based on the old slogan of revolutionary defeatism, which was advocated by Lenin for the cadres, not the masses. Yeah, for context, after the chauvinistic turn of the Second International in 1914, Lenin was compelled to bend the stick uh, to provide a correct position. Yeah, the, for the context, yeah, mass organizations of the working class were rallying behind their ruling classes at the time. But even then, he knew that the slogan of revolutionary defeatism was not meant for the masses, for the honest defensist uh, workers and peasants. It was meant to steal the cadres against social chauvinism. Instead, as the objective situation developed, the slogan of peace, bread and land was raised. And this allowed the Bolsheviks to connect to the revolutionary masses, which was the real objective. So for World War II, the context was even different. As this was a war perceived by the workers to be against fascism, and also by the Trotskyists for the defense of the USSR. So this mechanical approach by the RSL led them in 1940 for context, that was after the French defeat and uh, the rising threat of fascism at the gates of Britain, to say to a Labour Party meeting, comrades, the victory of Hitler is a lesser evil than to support your own ruling class. That got them kicked out of the Labour Party, unsurprisingly. 
And like good ultra lefts, they consoled themselves by thinking that because of their intransigent uh, revolutionary position, and that, and that of course uh, the workers would see the errors of their way and flock back to them. Well, of course, that didn't quite happen. As opposed to this, this uh, genuine Trotskyist, uh, Ted Grant's outfit, the Workers' International League, pushed for Trotsky's revolutionary military policy, that is, transitional demands in a military context. The basics are that imperialism cannot be trusted to wage an effective war against fascism, as happened in France when they capitulated rather than arming the workers, and as the imperialists had supported Hitler before the war. So therefore, the working class itself must be armed. Key industries such as armaments should be nationalized, and workers should be trained as well as officers uh, from the best elements of the working class under the direction of the trade unions. This allowed the WIL to make real gains in the British working class and in the military, including the 8th Army in Egypt. For the anecdote, uh, I will talk about the Forces Parliament, uh, which was organized by the generals in 1944, yes, to uh, entertain the troops so they could talk politics. In this parliament, the Trotskyists had such success that a Trotskyist prime minister and home secretary were elected. The parliament, of course, was quickly dissolved when the general saw that. But it shows the results of good slogans linked to the correct ideas when building support within the masses. Of course, I can find plenty other examples from the sects. We all have come across this, I'm sure, like the state capitalism theory, which, by the way, is purely based on quote mining from Lenin and Trotsky. But I will say this. Only our tendency carries the real heritage of Lenin and Trotsky, which is to be found in the ideas and the methods of Marxism. And we will proudly continue to carry that banner. Uh, thank you, for, comrades, for the uh, excellent discussion. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, Jack to sum up for about 20 minutes, including translation, uh, before we break for lunch. Jack? Yeah, thanks, comrades. I think it's been a really, really excellent and wide-ranging discussion. So to come back on a few points, first of all, on uh, Cuba that Joe raised, because this is really interesting, because these revolutionaries came to power with basically having the United States as their model. That's what they wanted to achieve. But they were honest revolutionaries who were determined to defend this, what they thought was a bourgeois democratic revolution. And so step by step, without any foresight, they are forced to go further and further. And just to defend the bourgeois democratic revolution, they have to overthrow capitalism. And this kind of thing is not a, a unique thing in history. Uh, comrades explained how the uh, Chinese revolution in the 1920s was defeated. Obviously, in 1949, you had a successful revolution and Mao came to power. And again, he uh, had a perspective of a long, long period of capitalism uh, in, in China. But in order to defend against foreign imperialism, in order to achieve national unity and land reform, I, to achieve the bourgeois democratic revolution, he had to break with capitalism. And that's very interesting, I think, when you consider this, the real difference between Lenin and Trotsky's original positions. Because Lenin never actually ruled out the direct transition from the bourgeois democratic to the socialist revolution. What he did was he put certain conditions on what would have to happen before you could have a transition towards a socialist revolution. He was saying basically you would need the support of the peasantry and you would need the support of the European working class. <coughs> the difference then was that Trotsky basically thought that this transition, it would basically set in inevitably from the logic of the development of the revolution itself. And what do you have in Cuba and China then? Against the subjective initial wishes of the actual leaders of the revolution, they are basically forced to abolish capitalism. This is like a laboratory proof, if you want, of the correctness of Trotsky's theory. Now, I said uh, that a revolutionary party doesn't create a revolution, um, that uh, the revolutionary party can play the role of educating the working class or quickening that education. 
Because, of course, we must understand that workers do learn from their own experience. But if there's, there's no political party to accelerate that, they have to learn through ser you know, series and series of damaging defeats. So that's what the Revolutionary Party can do. It's like a, a, a catalyst in a scientific experiment. It doesn't create the chemical reaction itself, but it speeds it up and can make it more economical. And that's what the political party can do in terms of accelerating the development of the consciousness of the working class. Obviously, this revolutionary party needs to be based on the correct ideas. And to call this uh, Eurocentric really is anti-democratic, it's uh, reactionary, and I'd say it's racist in itself. Can't people from outside of Europe decide which theory they like best themselves? And actually, the theory of the permanent revolution is the theory that best helps people precisely living outside of Europe. Now, uh, we've discussed this struggle that was um, waged against this growing bureaucracy. And one question that can be asked of us sometimes is, uh, why didn't Trotsky just take power himself? He was head of the Red Army, he was seemingly very popular, why didn't he just use this to defeat the bureaucracy? But what was the process that was taking place? There was a gradual reduction in political democracy as the working class were gradually leaving the Soviets under this immense social pressure. A successful revolution elsewhere could have politicized the working class, raised their confidence and brought them back into the Soviets. But what would have happened if Trotsky had taken power with using the army, the Red Army? Well, it would not have uh, revived the economy. The objective pressures would still be there. And rather than raising the consciousness and the confidence of the working class in Russia, it would actually lower it. Even, uh, you know, <laughs> it, this, this would have been something that would have happened without their participation, right? And so actually, uh, even if Trotsky had done this, it would have actually hastened the degeneration of the Soviet Union. Even if Trotsky was superficially the head uh, of the state, he would basically be a prisoner of the Red Army. So the only option they had then was this battle of ideas. Now, Bryce uh, said that um, in hindsight, of course, we all know that these international revolutions failed. But of course, just after the Russian Revolution, Lenin and Trotsky did not. And they carried out a foreign policy that was aimed at trying to radicalize the international working class. That was the first concern when they were negotiating the brest litovsk uh, peace treaty to end Russia's participation in the First World War. At this time, uh, Lenin said that he would give up the Russian Revolution if there was a successful revolution, if that meant there could be a successful revolution in Germany. Trotsky argued uh, that the position should be to not sign a peace treaty initially, but uh, to refuse to fight the war. This was the position uh, adopted by the Bolshevik Central Committee, but the Stalinists lie and say that Trotsky took this decision unilaterally. But the reason for this tactic was precisely because he had concern for the level of consciousness for the international revolution, the consciousness of the working class in the West. There was a huge amount of uh, propaganda in the former allies in the war of, uh, of Russia. It was sort of saying things, well, look at these sneaky Bolsheviks. They're just like all the uh, imperialists. They're making backroom deals to sign peace with Germany. And so Trotsky was advocating that you carry out this tactic because if the Germans then carried on their offensive, carried on this war, you could then capitulate later and you would be in a, a worse position uh, kind of superficially or on paper. But it would prove to the workers in uh, France, in Britain, that the, the Bolsheviks were completely different. And I think this position was fully confirmed. Uh, Karl Liebknecht, the great German revolutionary, wrote from prison uh, about how great this tactic was that the Bolsheviks uh, carried out. Now, uh, why was the Bolshevik position on the national question so important? Well, if you think Russia was a, a vast empire that contained many different nationalities, the vast majority of the population was not actually ethnically Russian. And so the Russian communists had to prove that they had no interest in oppressing the people from these nations. 
including the right to self-determination. You might think, oh, well, would that not weaken the, uh, the, the, the Soviet Union, weaken Russia? But actually, including this in your program uh, proves to the workers of oppressed nations that you have no interest in oppressing them. You are completely different from what came before. And so whilst uh, on the face of it, this demand, it, you know, you might think, well, doesn't that divide the working class on national lines? Well, it's, uh, it's dialectical. You prove that you have no interest in oppressing workers from these nations. And so through that, you unite the workers from the, uh, you know, <laughs> dominant nation and the oppressed nations. Um, OK, yeah, there's lots of funny examples of what the Trot so-called Trotskyists did after he died, but I'll skip that so we can have our lunch. <laughs> Comrades can read uh, History of British Trotskyism if they want to laugh a little bit. Anyway, when uh, I was preparing this talk, I was thinking, who are we talking to? And I thought back to when I was 16, which was a little bit of time ago. And I remember thinking, everyone I hate says that communism is awful. So I thought, well, I'd better look into this communism then. And I liked what I saw. But then I also started thinking, well, look, uh, these same people are also attacking Stalin. Maybe I should uh, see what he had to say for himself too. Anyway, the point uh, I'm trying to make is that uh, there are many more people like this now than there were when I was 16. But they will be uh, Googling communism and it's uh, kind of an accident maybe where some of them look first. They may end up uh, like Henry in a Stalinist organization. And so that's why it's so important for us to know uh, some of these seemingly kind of, uh, you know, archaic arguments, to know the real history of these two revolutionaries, Lenin and Trotsky. Because many of these people who might end up in these uh, Stalinist organizations, it is more than possible to win them over to us. But also one of the things I really want to underline is this necessity to master the method of Marxism. What we want to do when we study these things is not to just memorize hundreds of thousands of quotes from Lenin and Trotsky. It's precisely by doing that that you will end up like these so-called followers of uh, Lenin and Trotsky. No, we want to master the method of Marxism. We want to recruit as many of these young people moving in the direction of communism as we can. And it's on that road that we'll be victorious. Thanks.